Order. God, may your spirit and guidance be in us as we work for the benefit of all our people, for peace and justice in our land, and for the constant recognition of the dignity and aspirations of those whom we serve. God, please be with those that are ill and those that are suffering the loss of loved ones. We send prayers to the member for Great Slave who recently lost her mother, and also to our own Haley Carlson as she continues her brave battle with cancer. Minister statements. Minister statements. Minister responsible for environment and natural resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, caribou are a center to our communities as a food source and part of our local culture and way of life. As you know, Mr. Speaker, our caribou herds are struggling. In particular, the Bathurst and the Blue Nose East herds that have suffered serious declines in recent years. The Government of the Northwest Territories is committed to support our caribou through periods of decline. Today I'm here to highlight some of the actions the Department of Environment and Natural Resources is, is leading our government's efforts to manage human impact on Bathurst caribou herd. Mr. Speaker, five years ago the Government of Northwest Territories, together with Indigenous governments <coughs> and organizations and the Wekoji Renewable Resource Board, made the difficult decision to close the Bathurst caribou harvest. As a re result of this decision, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources set up a no-harvest no zone around the Bathurst caribou, known as the mo Mobile Zone. The borders of this zone changes every week based on the locations of the collar caribou. This is how we make sure the caribou are protected. It is illegal to hunt caribou in this, this zone, Mr. Speaker. Officers monitor the area by the ground and by air throughout the winter. We have two checkpoints at Gordon and McKay Lake that are staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Local community members also assist environmental and natural resources with the harvesting, harvest monitoring. It is important that all hunters go out on the land know where this zone is. Maps with the current mobile zone are posted on the Environmental and Natural Resources website and Facebook page, on the winter roads and in our communities. Mr. Speaker, the people of Northwest Territories take care of conservation very seriously. We continue to work with our co-management partners to communicate the importance of this zone for protecting the Bathurst caribou. It is up to each and every one of us to do our part to promote this herd's recovery. Last August, the Government of Northwest Territory released the Bathurst Caribou Range Plan. This plan guides decision makers, developers and communities to help manage activities on the land in a way that supports the recovery of the Bathurst herd. Our government is now working to set this plan into motion. This includes sitting down with our Indigenous partners to identify important habitat for Bathurst caribou, such as key land and water crossings and areas of unburnt forest. I'm also pleased to report on our efforts to expand on-the-land programs to monitor, to monitor caribou, Bathurst caribou. Last month, a workshop with Indigenous groups from across the range of the Bathurst herd was held to further develop a Bathurst guardianship initiative, which includes representatives from Nunavut. The workshop was brought in members of the Hamai Us uh, stewardship network from the Queen Charlotte Islands to share their knowledge and experience in, as guardians on their traditional lands. Mr. Speaker, traditional knowledge tells us caribou have experienced periods of highs and lows. The current population established for the Bathurst herd is the lowest it's ever been and that, we, and that we know of. It's up to us to support our caribou herd through this current low and to, towards recovery. 
ENR has heard from communities and wildlife co-management partners that all management actions need to be considered, including wolf management. Environment and Natural Resources and the Cleetshow government developed a wolf management proposal based on the best available traditional, local and scientific knowledge. It includes management actions for wolves on the winter age of the Bathurst and the Blue Nose Herd as a way to promote the recovery of these barren ground caribou herds and support the traditional economy. The next population survey for the Bass Earth Caribou is just a few months away in June and the results will be available in late fall. Together with the local and traditional knowledge, these surveys and results will inform our actions going forward to manage and protect barren ground caribou. By applying the best available knowledge together with our co-management partners, we can help support healthy caribou populations for future generations of Northerners. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister's statements. Minister's statements. Members, I'd like to draw your attention to a member in the gallery, former member Bill Braden, who is a member for Great Slave in the 14th and 15th Legislative Assembly. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Thabatcha. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, for my member statement today, I would like to address the point made in yesterday's commissioner's, commissioner's address regarding modernizing airport infrastructure in the NWT. Mr. Speaker, on June the 17, 2019, the leadership of the community of Fort Smith wrote a letter to the former Minister of Infrastructure regarding narrowing the main runway at the Fort Smith Regional Airport. The leadership felt that by narrowing the runway, disastrous results could happen if Fort Smith had to evacuate due to forest fire or other natural disasters. The leadership felt that this decision was made unilaterally without consent from the community of Fort Smith. A drastic change without consultation with the community of Fort Smith is not acceptable. Mr. Speaker, I have also been informed that the Arctic Light LED package was not put in at the airport, therefore causing multiple safety issues relating to risk factors of takeoff and landing. In discussion with the former infrastructure minister and senior management of that department, I was told that Transport Canada instructed the Department of Infrastructure to narrow the airport's runway by 50 feet on both sides and change the lighting system at a cost of $2.3 million. No other airport in the NWT was forced to endure such extreme changes to their airport infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the point of modernizing airports has failed in Fort Smith based on the reduction of the runway that was forced on our community. I will have questions for the Minister of Infrastructure at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabatcha. Member statements. Member for Monthly. Masiya, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, did they get a Mr. Speaker, I like to talk about uh, justice. I want to say a few words regarding that. Canada's Office of the Correction Inspector says that Canada Correction System has reached an all-time low for Indigenous population, comprising barely a 20th of the general population. Indigenous people now account for almost third of the federal inmates. That's an incarceration rate six times of the mainstream Canada. Mr. Speaker, in Northwest Territories, the rates of imprisonment for Indigenous persons are equally troubling. 83%, Mr. Speaker, 83% of people behind bars in the Northwest Territories are either Dene, Métis, or Inuit. In the case of women, it's 100%. Mr. Speaker, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls upon our territorial government 
on recommendation number 30 to commit to eliminating the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in custody over the next decade. Also, Mr. Speaker, it goes even further. The TRC recommendation number 31 calls upon the territorial government to provide sufficient and stable funding to implement and evaluate community sanctions that will provide realistic alternative imprisonment for Aboriginal offenders and respond to the underlying causes of offending. Mr. Speaker, at the appropriate time, I will have questions for the minister responsible. Merci. Thank you, member for Mumpui. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Hay River South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to speak about the stagnant economic condition in the NWT, and more specifically, to regions outside Yellowknife. In these uncertain economic times, we must understand that the majority of current business opportunities for the regions are tied directly to government projects. Keeping this in mind, it is important that we as government ensure that our northern businesses and residents have first opportunity to participate in any and all government funded projects. It is important that these projects are not delayed in order that we can put northern companies and northern people to work. Mr. Speaker, I understand that we have processes in place to make sure this happens. However, it is within these very processes that we fall short when it comes to carrying out projects in a timely manner or doing everything we can to support businesses and create northern employment. Mr. Speaker, our business incentive policy, although an excellent tool that provides support to northern businesses, does fall short for large projects and the monitoring of northern content, content while work is ongoing. Our hit and miss schedule of 20 and 30 day payments for contractors when not followed can cause a business to experience undue financial hardship and sometimes push them to the brink of failure. Then there is the dreaded red tape we continue to pile on our northern businesses, which drives up costs of doing business while reducing productivity that ultimately takes away from timely delivery of projects. This often results in contractors being penalized through non-payment, holdbacks, or being told they cannot bid on future projects. Mr. Speaker, a further reality is that with the Alberta economy suffering, we are experiencing an influx of southern contractors with which our northern business must compete. When our northern businesses lose a contract to a southern firm, it results in the bleeding of dollars outside of our communities, out of the regions, and out of the NWT. These, these may be the very 75 cent dollars we fight to receive from the federal government for projects or services in the NWT, and we are throwing them away. This government has, Mr. Speaker, this government has a responsibility to support our northern businesses and provide our residents with job opportunities. It is time we stand up for our businesses and our residents. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Hay River South. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Nuvik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I'm going to talk about the past, the present, and what the future may hold for trades in my community. My, Mr. Speaker, as far back as grade six, I can remember being introduced to the trade of carpentry. I can remember Mr. Gordon teaching us the basic skills in our options class. As I moved through the grades, I remember shop, automotive, and other trades offered to students. There was even a stream in our school for those who were more interested in the trades and focused solely in this area. It was a practical program in the senior high school. Today, if we're lucky to have a teacher in our school that can teach the trades in combinations with other classes like math, English, or science, we'll offer some intro to trades in our school. Mr. Speaker, how do we get more youth interested in carpentry, welding, mechanics, or to become an electrician, or any other trade, if we're not exposing these to them, or providing support for those who are interested in trades? And yes, I know, Mr. Speaker, students need to achieve an education level high enough to pass these trades exams and apprentice programs to obtain their journeyman certificates, I feel if we were given the giving them the opportunities to experience these areas, it may empower them to achieve what they need in their education. 
In my community of Inuvik, we have trade trailers that were purchased in partnership with our local indigenous groups and the GNWT, but they seem to do more sitting than using. In my, uh, within the past few weeks, months of briefings from the departments and budgets and looking at future capital projects, I'm afraid that we'll be continue to use out-of-territory workers to complete these projects. Mr. Speaker, I want the Minister of Education to look at how we can increase opportunities for trades to our youth, as well support our local small businesses to apprentice them throughout the years it takes to obtain their German journeyman certificates. As the current funding is only for two years, and my understanding the reason the department gives is they make money for the company in third and fourth year. Small businesses face a lot more expenses and try to keep people working even when the economy is slow. And in our community, there's not much going on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll have questions for the Minister of ECE. Thank you, Member for Inuvik Twin Lakes. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Yale Knife Centre. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our brand new hospital has been plagued with problems from the day it opened in May. First, it was the food provided by the kitchen. Now, eight months after opening, there are chronic plumbing and heating issues. It's my understanding that the new Stanton Hospital has more mechanical problems than the one it replaced. These ongoing problems are distressing for staff, patients, and residents of the NWT who expected so much more from the most expensive building the GNWT has ever built. Mr. Speaker, I spent a day inside the emergency department before Christmas with a bad knee. An alarm rang for hours, and I understand alarm fatigue is now a problem because medical staff don't know whether the alarm is for a real problem or whether it's an all too frequent false alarm. Throughout the day, staff shared cell phone pictures of doors frosted over, as well as stories about how cold the hallways are near the outside doors, while others are uncomfortably hot. They've been dealing with plumbing problems since the hospital opened, and as recently as yesterday, and they are tired of the workarounds. Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister, staff at the Department and the Hospital Health Authority are aware of these problems, but their best efforts haven't resulted in an end to the problems. I'm not sure if there are new problems every week or whether the problems have been multiplying since the hospital handover. I have no idea who is doing the repairs and what they are costing. Does the hospital have a warranty, like a new home, and how long is it good for? Mr. Speaker, you may be aware that a hospital constructed in North Battleford, Saskatchewan, using the same P3 model and a 30-year maintenance contract, that hospital, which opened two months before ours, has had some of the same problems with mechanical systems. In fact, the problems in the North Battleford Hospital are so extensive, they triggered a third-party construction audit of the project. A media report says the audit will review the quality of materials, equipment, labour and workmanship used during the building. It's expected to be complete sometime this spring. Mr. Speaker, the current state of our brand new hospital is discouraging, to say the least. We expected better of this $350 million facility. We want to know that we're getting value for money. I will have questions for the Minister of Health and Social Services. Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife Centre. Member Statements. Member for Kemley. Mr. Speaker, trust is a fragile and powerful thing. What can take decades to build can be broken in one action. Surveys show that the professions trusted most by Canadians are scientists, nurses, doctors and teachers, while politicians, unfortunately, are found at the bottom of the list. Today, only 13% of Canadians trust politicians. This is important because we know that in order to truly work together, all Northerners need to trust each other. I recently read an article which implied that the public's lack of trust in politicians is based on the sense that the old boys club is maintaining the status quo to serve its own interests. Last October, Northern voters changed the face of politics. I was motivated by a rejection of the old boys club. I stand in a gender-based assembly where more than half of the members are Indigenous, but that doesn't automatically mean that as a government we have changed how we operate, how we staff, do business, or our trustworthiness. People sense three kinds of trust, Mr. Speaker. 
competency, emotional, and ethical trust. Competency trust is earned and it reflects the knowledge we have and how we use it. We get this trust in steps, but we also lose it in steps. Emotional trust is based on how we make people feel. We earn it by making people feel safe and typically lose it gradually a little at a time. Ethical trust though, Mr. Speaker, is the hardest to earn and the hardest to keep. It is earned through principled actions and decision-making that can be lost in an instant. Mr. Speaker, building trust takes the work required to understand the unique challenges of our people, the curiosity and empathy to care, and the courage to do what is right. This trust is a feedback loop of not only gaining trust, but also giving it both inside the House, within departments, other levels of government, and community organizations, and within our own neighbourhoods. Trust allows us to have each other's back, work side by side, and advance with confidence towards common purpose. The Greek word democracy literally means rule by the people, and its definition is a system of government by the whole population. By that definition, to truly govern, Mr. Speaker, we need to build all three kinds of trust. As we work to evolve governance and decision-making by welcoming everyone to the table, I hope that over time we can collectively rebuild our trust accounts. Northerners need to trust that their words, concerns, and passions for the North are reflected through our work here. We as politicians must respect all voices and be humbled by the capability of our actions when we trust each other. To govern justly with, bold, sorry, with both love and power, it is up to all of us to start rebuilding our trust accounts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Nanakput. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, my member's statement, Mr. Speaker, is on cancer. It continues to touch the lives of so many people across our territory, and it's taking our loved ones far too often. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the frontline staff and health and social services who work every day with those affected with cancer, from the doctors, the nurses, and the people that book medical travel. These are caring professionals. They help cancer patients navigate the medical system in such stressful times in their lives. Unfortunately, we face challenges such as in the remote communities that I represent in Anukwit, Mr. Speaker. The location in our communities has a long wait times for appointments. These make timely treatment of cancer even more challenging to the north to there are two things I believe this department can do to improve the outcomes of our cancer patients across the territory in the Beaufort Delta. First, I'd like to see the health and social services provide a Beaufort Delta Health Authority with a dedicated person focused on doing travel arrangement solely for cancer patients. Focused on doing travel arrangements, the doctor um, alleviate the pressure on the, our local uh, frontline staff to ensure someone is uh, the travels booked up and the follow-ups. The follow-ups are so important that the people are missing their some appointments. The cancer patients are booked most in a timely manner. Second, I believe that we could be doing more to prevent cancer through pre-screening. That cancer pre-screening takes place when the medical appointments, but many people don't go to a doctor unless they feel sick in our home communities. I'd like the commitment from the minister today to develop a pilot project with me that would work and enable a team of professionals to travel to smaller communities at least once a year to cancer pre-screening, especially with our mobile, uh, with, uh, for less mobile elders, mobile elders. With today's technology, many cancers such as colon cancer, breast cancer, and skin cancer can be de detected with a simple non-invasive procedures. Mr. Speaker, as the MLA, I'm tired of attending of funerals and friends in my family uh, have taken by cancer. Today, I'm asking the Minister of Social Services to work with me to improve the lives of people in the Beaufort Delta and the Sawtoo in all the territory to do pre-screening uh, of uh, cancer patients that uh, were um, able to improve their lives and the outcomes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Nanakput. Member statements. Member statements. Member for Tunaday Walade. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I am proud to let the House know that the Lutsuke Dene First Nation is implementing a two year self imposed 
moratorium on hunting the Bathurst Kiribati. This was just announced yesterday and will be a stewardship plan led by the community members and the plan is called Yuneda Ha Aten Hati. Directly translated, this means the future of our caribou in Denis Sonsling. As everyone is well aware, there, have been a, there has been a severe decline in the Bathurst caribou herd population over the years. The GNTB even, even went as far as to ban the harvesting caribou in its mobile hunting areas since 2015. Mr. Speaker, what will this initial implementation look like of this uh, hunting moratorium? Well, the Lutsuka Dene First Nation have hired four full-time Nihatni Dene rangers in order to, and as the name suggests, watch over and monitor the land, wildlife, and visitors. This will include hunters within Athai Dene protected areas. I'd like to congratulate Chief Daryl Marlow and the LKDFN for taking an initiative in protecting this caribou herd for future generations. I sincerely hope that other First Nations will uh, take notice and follow suit, and I hope that this government will support endeavors such as these. In closing, Mr. Speaker, I want to leave a, with a quote from the Lutsuke Dene First Nations Caribou Stewardship Plan that speaks to the LKDFN values and love for the caribou, and I hope it resonates with you. The caribou are listening to us. We shouldn't talk too much about a tent. They are listening to us. We must speak good words for them, and we must help protect them. The Aten have their own natural laws, and as such, we have to respect the ways of the Aten and all other life forms. Master Cho, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, that'll be all for now. Um, I will have some questions for the Minister of uh, Environment and Natural Resources later. Thank you, Member for Tuna de Wilde. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Over the last few months, Yellowknife MLAs met with trustees of Yellowknife Catholic Schools in Yellowknife District No. 1 and the Commission Scolaire Francophone Territoire du Nord-Ouest. The City of Yellowknife held a plebiscite on extending the term of office for its councillors to four years uh, from three in 2018. Of the Yellowknife voters who voted 60.6% were in favour and a bylaw to extend the term of office for mayor and council to four years was passed. The term of office for Yellowknife City Council and the Yellowknife Education Authorities are now out of sync. Elections were held at the same time, piggybacking onto the city's efforts and processes. If the Yellowknife District uh, or Yellowknife Education Authorities need to hold their own elections, the cost will be approximately $90,000 more in terms of advertising, hiring workers, and other expenses. I'm sure we would all rather see that funding spent on our children's education rather than running a separate election. For CSF TNO, the situation is more interesting in that half of its commissiles are from Yellowknife, uh, where there is now a four-year term for council, and the other half are from Yel uh, Hay River, where there is a three-year term for that local government. CSF TNO holds its own elections, if necessary, at its schools, so there is little additional cost, but an obvious need for coordination. Unfortunately, it looks like it would, be, it would take a change to the Education Act to adjust the terms of office uh, for education authorities to account for the four-year term of the Yellowknife City Council. The current wording in the Education Act already contemplates coordination of the terms of office. However, it does not deal with the situation we are now in where a local government body has a term of office beyond three years or for csf TNO, where there are different terms of office for the local governments that its commissaires represent. I raised this issue almost a year ago, was told by then Minister of Education, quote, the good news is that we have a couple of years uh, until the next election uh, so that we can actually have it dealt with before the election. That's the end of the quote. I will be asking the Minister of Education, Culture and Employment questions later today on whether the political will exists to make the necessary changes before 2021. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Member Statements. Member Statements. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
As we sit in this house, we must never forget who we serve. We serve the people on the ground. And the reality is, is that so many of them are hurting. The reality is in the, the north is in the bottom of most social indicators in Canada. We are dealing with a history of both past and ongoing colonialism and ongoing trauma from residential schools. And there are so many issues and only limited resources. Often in this house, we can feel like we are being pulled in many directions. Our government is a large ship and we all have a responsibility to make sure that it goes in a coherent, strategic direction. Today, I would like to speak about one of the many issues facing our territory. We are presently in a suicide crisis, Mr. Speaker. We have among the highest rates of suicide in the North. Additionally, we can only do so much with the information we have and there is a lack of data on this. Often when there is a suicide, there is 20 times as many attempts. Additionally, many of our residents head south and they disappear into larger urban centers where they too often fall to suicide and additions, and we don't track those numbers properly. Mr. Speaker, we have a responsibility to do more. To do more. We have a responsibility to develop a suicide prevention strategy, working with our indigenous governments, working with the federal government, and working across departments to make sure we are getting a full picture of this crisis. We have a responsibility to help those who are hurting, especially those in our small communities and those who have lost hope, Mr. Speaker. I will have questions for the Minister of Health and Social Services. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North. Member Statements. Member Statements returns to oral questions. Returns to oral questions. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Member for Nubik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to recognize my <coughs> CA, Loretta Rogers. And I'd also like to recognize a former colleague, John Stevenson. We both sat as previous chairs of education boards. Thank you, member for Nubik Twin Lakes. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. Member for Yellowknife North. Or, sorry, Hay River North. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I would also like to recognize Mr. John Stevenson, uh, the former chair of the Yellowknife uh, One District Education Authority. I never had a chance to, to work directly with him. Our terms didn't quite overlap, but I've heard nothing but good things, and I look forward to working with him as he's still a trustee on the board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Hay River North. Recognition of visitors in the gallery. If we have missed anyone in the gallery today, welcome to the chamber. I hope you are enjoying the proceedings and it is always nice to have an audience with us today. Thank you. Acknowledgements. Acknowledgements. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Yellowknife Centre. Mr. Speaker, my questions are for the Minister of Health and Social Services. As I mentioned in my statement, residents of the NWT expected that a brand new hospital would be better than the old one, but so far the new hospital has been plagued with problems, especially with plumbing and heating. My first question to the Minister is whether the new hospital has a warranty and whether that warranty is still in effect. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife Centre. Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I'd like uh, to let the member know that yes, there is a warranty, and it's between the designer uh, builder and the service provider, which is Dextera. It was for a base period of one year to to it was. It was for a base period of one year to November 30th, 2019. There is a 10 year late, latent def defects warranty. Under the protect project agreement, the GWT is provided with protection by transfer of responsibility and risk to the P3 partner, which is BHP and Dextera. 
who is responsible for dealing with the building performance issues, also the associated costs, and it's over life of a 30-year uh, agreement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yale Life Center, first supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for that response. So, as, as I understand it, then the repairs are being done and paid for by uh, the uh, contractor. Do I have that correct? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellow Knife Center. Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, yes, that is correct. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellow Knife Center. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for that. Who inspected the new hospital before it opened, and what were the findings uh, of deficiencies, if any? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellow Knife Center. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Under the project agreement, the P, uh, P3 partner, which is Boreal Health Partnership, was responsible for ensuring that the building was reviewed before the building was made available to the GWT on November 30th, 2018. That's the service commencement uh, to begin preparation for moving the services to the new hospital. All construction work undertaken was also subject to a sign-off by an independent certifier. BHP engaged the architect and engineers of record who were liable for final reviews and approval that the facility is fit for use. The reviews ensured compliance with a range of technical requirements in accordance with the project agreement, the technical requirements as well as codes, standards and laws. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions, final supplementary, Yellow Knife Center. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for that. Um, Mr. Speaker, in Saskatchewan, the government is paying for a third-party audit of construction following uh, similar problems at the North Battleford Hospital. Is the Minister willing to contract a construction audit of the new Stanton Hospital so that we get uh, an overall picture of the ongoing problems with the building? Thank you. Thank you, for Member for Yellow Knife Centre. Minister responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we are aware of the issues in Saskatchewan, which were much more severe than what the challenges we have faced within the Stanton Hospital. Uh, our focus is working with the P3 partners to ensure challenges that, that have been experienced are dealt with. We are seeing the number of issues decline over time. The project agreement provides provisions to enable the GWT to undertake reviews and audits uh, of the services provided by Dexterra during the life of this agreement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Inuvik Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, um, my questions are for the Minister of Education, Culture, and Employment. Will the minister advise me if they will be running the school's North Apprenticeship Program, referred to as the SNAP program, in my community this year? If not, why? And will, this de will his department reconsider? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for New Vic Twin Lakes. Minister responsible for education, culture, and employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The SNAP program, uh, as the minister or the, uh, the member mentioned, the school's North Apprenticeship Program doesn't run on a schedule. It's, it's not a regular part of the curriculum. So there's no scheduled start time uh, right now. The program requires a significant number of parties to all come together. Uh, you need employers, you need the schools, you need students, parents, and ECE uh, to ensure that uh, things run smoothly. So if there's an interest from employers and there's an interest from students, then there's something uh, we can facilitate. This is something we can facilitate and we can use this program. Uh, so I'll speak to the department to explore some further options. Uh, we have our career and education advisors who might be able to help facilitate this. But uh, the first thing that we need is to have some uh, participants who are willing to, uh, to help us move forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for New Twin Lakes. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, in my state member statement, I also talked about um, the trades trailers that are in my community that have been sitting there. Will the minister advise me what the plan from the department is to continue to work with the Indigenous governments in my community and tr to ensure that these trailers are being utilized for the purpose they were purchased for? Thank you. Thank you, member for Newvik Twin Lakes, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so the, the Aurora College offers trades, industrial and occupational training in the Trades Mobile Training Lab. Uh, this lab, it's a state-of-the-art facility. Um, I think it's just pretty cool, basically. Uh, we're always open to uh, having these discussions with Indigenous governments. In 2019, December, the, the lab returned from Inuvik, or returned to Inuvik from Tuck after offering the Building Trades Helper Program. And uh, there are ongoing dis discussions about how we can better use this lab in the Beaufort Delta for things such as trade preparation, entry-level programs for youth to enhance employment skills, and the Building Trades Helper Program. And as the transformation of Aurora College into a polytechnic continues, there's going to be even more opportunities to utilize uh, this tool. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for New Victor Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that. I look forward to the ongoing work in that area. Um, will the Minister ensure that um, small businesses that have apprentices with, that utilize the on-the-job funding to support them keep the, uh, are, to support them to keep the apprentice until they reach their journeyman certificate? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for New Twin Lakes, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, my colleague is speaking about the Trades and Occupations Wage Subsidy Program in which the department tops off the wages for apprentices for a couple of years. Uh, she noted that it doesn't fall, necessarily follow the, the apprentice all the way through, and that's because the pot of money just isn't big enough to, to do that. Uh, we can't cover everyone. Um, you know, I'm looking forward in this assembly to increasing the number of apprentices and journey people we have in the territory. And if this is something that we think is useful and a way to do that, then I look forward to having those budget discussions with cabinet and with the regular members and uh, seeing if that's where we want to allocate our limited resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary, Anubik Twin Lakes. Just one last thing. Would the minister, since I'm pretty sure is SFA falls under the minister's department, if, if they could look at maybe a way that that would help apprentices continue on and maybe support them in that area? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for New Victor Lakes, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So SFA is for um, students who are who are studying, uh, and so I don't know if that's an appropriate uh, avenue to fund, provide funds to somebody who's working as an apprentice, but uh, you know, I've, I've been speaking for years about the need to get more apprentices in the territory. Uh, we have so many uh, journey people who have, are retiring, who have retired, and like the rest of Canada, we just don't have the people to replace them, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, and I'm committed to increasing that number during the life of this assembly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Thabatcha. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, further to my member's statement, the community of Fort Smith's concerns regarding narrowing of the airport has not been addressed. My question is, why are safety issues at the Fort Smith airport not being addressed? Thank you, Member for Thabatcha, Minister Responsible of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, safety is our top priority in the operation and maintenance of the Northwest Territories transportation system, including the airports. Transport Canada sets the standards by which airports are designed and operated. The GNWT is responsible for constructing, operating, and maintaining airports for those to those standards. The GNWT is also responsible for reviewing airport infrastructure and planning for future operational and regulatory needs. The recent projects undertaken at the Fort Smith Airport, the installation of LED lighting and the right sizing of the runway, were undertaken when the standards and regulations set by Transport Canada and were designed and completed to industry and professional standards. 
I would like to, to assure the member that neither the safety nor the level of service at the Fort Smith Airport has changed as a result of these projects. The GNWT maintains a safety management system, the SMS, for all of our 27 airports. At this time, there are no outstanding safety issues at the Fort Smith Airport. We continue to encourage individuals to report hazards and safety concerns through the SMS protocols. I can forward those protocols to the member if she would like, and they are also available on the GNWT website. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Thabatcha. Mr. Speaker, what was the point of spending $2.3 million on, on an airport runway that was operational and running fine? Thank you, Member for Thabatcha. Minister of Infrastructure. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The decision to replace the airside, light, sorry, the airside lighting and to narrow the runway at the Fort Smith Airport was made based on current and future operational and regulatory needs. As part of ongoing airport planning, it was determined the aging lighting system needed to be replaced. It was also determined that a 30-meter runway would meet federal regulations and would not affect the level of service at the Fort Smith Airport. Because the lighting replacement project would require digging up sections of the airport of the runway, it made good sense to complete both projects at the same time. Mr. Speaker, when the Fort Smith Airport was designed and built in 1957, 60 meters was a common width for paved runways, and it was predicted at the time that future aircraft would be bigger and larger runways would be required. That is in fact not the case. Modern aircraft have, been, have improved performance, and the federal regulator has established that wider runways are not necessary. The costs to operate and maintain a 30-metre runway are significantly less than to operate and maintain a 60-metre runway. The costs to repair or overlay a 30-metre runway will also be less. I would like to assure the member that the decision to proceed with these projects was made with the safety of citizens in the front of our minds. The decision was also based on operational needs, minimizing costs to the Government of the Northwest Territories and to taxpayers, and ensuring ongoing eligibility for federal funding for future capital projects at the Fort Smith Airport. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Thabatcha. Mr. Speaker, the new lights that were installed at the Fort Smith Airport were not the Arctic kit that was supposed to be installed at the, at the airport as said in the July 8, 2019 letter from the former Minister of Infrastructure. My question is, when will this be addressed? Thank you, Member for Thabatcha, Minister of Infrastructure. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. During the design phase, it was determined that due to the regional climate, Arctic kits were not required for the lighting at the Fort Smith Airport. Therefore, they were not included in the design. The Fort Smith airfield lighting is checked at least twice daily by maintenance staff at the airport and documented in accordance with our preventative maintenance processes and is, it is operating to specification. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, Member for Thabatcha. Mr. Speaker, senior management within the Department of in Infrastructure still insists that this decision was given by Transport Canada. So will the Department of Infrastructure share this letter of direction from Transport Canada? Thank you, Member for Sabacha, Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to clarify that there was no decision or direction given by Transport Canada to narrow the runway. Uh, I, Transport Canada is responsible for establishing the regulations and standards. The current standards indicate that a 30-meter runway is required for the type of airport and service in Fort Smith, and I would be happy to share the Department of Infrastructure's copies of these standards with the member. Transport Canada also administers the Airport Capital Assistance Program. This is the program that the GNWT relies on for funding for construction and maintenance of its airport system. It is unlikely that Transport Canada would fund future pavement overlay or capital projects for a runway that was wider than the regulator standard. The decision to proceed with these projects was made by the Department of Infrastructure and was based on the established standards, operational needs, and budget considerations. And I would like to say I maybe did misspeak that to you earlier in saying that it was a direction from Transport Canada, so I acknowledge that error, and that was mine being new to the role. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Nanakwit.
Mr. Speaker, today I brought up uh, who's not affected by cancer in our great territory. And for my people that I represent in Anakput, have to travel out for one day appointment, either to Inuvik is probably four days because of the timing of flights and stuff like that. And safety, uh, the, I guess the safety of my constituents that I want to bring up, Mr. Speaker, um, is, is a minister working in the department to, identif to identify uh, cancer for Northerners and how could we uh, speed process up to help uh, them travel to get their, to their appointments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nanakput, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member is correct. Cancer in the Northwest Territories is quite high, uh, as with other parts of Canada, and the number of people with chronic disease continues to grow, as the, and the age of diagnosis is younger. The department continues to help reduce the impact of uh, chronic disease such as cancer by prevention, early detection through screening and effective medical and self-management. In the Northwest Territories, we have uh, guidelines for screening for the following three cancers, the breast, cervical and colorectal. There's been ex extension, extensive promotion of cancer screening such as brochures and posters related to colorectal cervical and breast cancer screening, prevention messages on how to reduce your cancer risk, as well as healthy living resources around nutrition, physical activity, alcohol management, and tobacco cessation. Infographics on most recent cancer screening rates for the cervical, colorectal, and breast cancer screening. So we have cancer information that's available for um, the residents of the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. First supplementary, member for Nanakput. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, putting out pamphlets and stuff like that don't mean nothing. It's good to have them in the community, but we need to know what's the improvement on the health care system and the department is currently working on today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Nanakput, Minister of Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to speak about some, th some uh, activities that we're doing that are new. In the communities, the community health representatives are provided with training in relation to cancer screening. In the fall, as well as information to cancer prevention, screening, and healthy living resource. We're launching nine videos related to cervical, colorectal, and breast cancer screening in the Northwest Territories, and two videos will be launched to address cancer screening in general. The Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority is launching a pilot project on the cancer screening program in the Beaufort Delta this month in hopes of increasing the number of people being screened. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Nanakput. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I'd like to consider establishing a dedicated position to manage travel arrangements for cancer patients with a mandate to expedite travel to minimize delays for the people that I represent in, in our small communities of, in the Beaufort Delta as a whole, to, to get a doctor and a care unit to going into the communities at least once a year to try to uh, um, catch cancer. Because by the time it's caught, it's either stage three or stage four. We can't do nothing. Then we're losing loved ones because of the system. Mr. Speaker, is the minister willing to to work with me to do a pilot project in the Beaufort Delta to provide service for all nine communities in, our, in the region to prevent cancer. And uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nanakput, Minister of Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Northwest Territories Health Social Service Authorities just recently hired two full-time cancer nurse nav navigators. This is in order to assist patients and their families through the cancer care continuum. I understand the member's question is to have a commitment to be able to go into the Beaufort Delta communities. And at this time, it's something we will look into. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final short supplementary, member for Nanakput. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, so many families are affected by cancer. 
I'm asking the minister today to commit, just say yes with me, on the pilot project for Beaufort Delta to establish a team of professionals that will travel into the communities to do pre-screening to our elders and to the people that can't leave the community, that only go to the nursing station when they say, I'm not, when they're really sick, they're not going to go and waste, uh, they feel like they're not going to waste people's time because they're not, you know, they're not feeling well. They got to be really sick to go to the health center. You know that, Mr. Speaker. All I'm asking is that if we could do a pilot project for one year and then to, to, to see how many people's lives that we could save in the people that we serve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Member for Nanakput, Minister of Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I mentioned uh, earlier in my response that you know, we recognize that cancer is high in not only in the Beaufort Delta, but also in the Northwest Territories. Um, I understand the, the member for Nunakbut is asking for a commitment, and I recognize, you know, in the region is quite high. It's something we will look into. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Mumfoy. Masia, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, do you know the, um, I spoke earlier on correction, Department of Justice, and I mentioned that majority of the incarcerated people are the Dene people. I'd like to ask a question regarding um, that. Inspector of Correction calls a, a nation, national travesty. I'd like to ask the following question to the Minister of Justice. More specifically, how is our correctional system helping Indigenous inmates to reduce the chances of reoffending once they leave their prison system? Merci. Thank you, Member for Mumfui, Minister responsible for Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we currently have programs in place between the Correctional Service working inside our incarceration facilities and with communities to ensure that individuals have a reintegration plan before they go into the community, uh, and that is meant to be a, one of the key ways in which we're hoping to assist individuals to not uh, reoffend. Uh, in addition, of course, this is something that involves partnerships throughout all of government to ensure that people have the right supports in their communities so that they can continue to live uh, lives that are healthy when they are out of the facilities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for Mumfoy. Masia, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm just curious about the, the priorities of this government. Um, what priority uh, is this go uh, minister given the, to, to the problem of the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in our correctional system? Masi. Thank you, Member for Mumfui, Minister of Justice. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, as, uh, as all of my colleagues here know, uh, over-incarceration of Indigenous people was not an express priority uh, that we noted for the members of the 19th Assembly. Nevertheless, uh, I've already stated publicly that this is a priority for me personally. It's an issue that I have personally been engaged on for many years, uh, and I can't imagine that uh, anyone that knew me in my past life would expect me to come into this House and not see this as a personal priority. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I would certainly like to assure that uh, doing my part as Minister of Justice and the, the uh, Department of Justice of the Northwest Territories will be considering that a priority over the next four years. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Member for Mumfoy. Merci, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, just reflecting on the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission 94 recommendation. Obviously, there is uh, one recommendation that I highlight as uh, part of the member statement. Are there sufficient and stable funds within the Department of Justice to implement and evaluate these measures that uh, provide realistic alternative to imprisonment for Aboriginal offenders? Master, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Mumfui, Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have no doubt that any department would like to see more funds that would certainly make the, the work easier. 
Uh, at the same time, am I confident there's enough ability within and enough capacity within the Department of Justice to address this? And Mr. Speaker, I would say yes. When the story broke nationally about the rates of incarceration of Indigenous people, I met immediately with senior members uh, from the Justice Department, and we are beginning to consider what things we can do within our control to affect uh, the over-incarceration of Indigenous people. It will be a cross-government issue that we need to deal with. It will be a multiple level of government issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, and to that end, we remain engaged with a national task force in terms of a national strategy, but we are beginning to take steps to look at what we can do here at home, uh, and I hope to be coming back with that plan in due course. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary member for Mumphrey. Monsieur, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, again, uh, reflecting back on uh, the TRC uh, recommendation, um, it talks about reducing the systematic discrimination. So looking into the future, what are the minister's plans to reducing the systematic discrimination that indigenous people experience in our judicial system or justice system and in our correction system? Merci, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Mumphrey, Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there are fortunately a number of initiatives I can speak to. Uh, there is certainly is the a significant effort within corrections to have Indigenous cultural safety training for all staff. There is efforts to have Aboriginal liaisons available to all individuals within the within the uh, correctional system. Uh, there is, in addition to that, a number of uh, initiatives to ensure there are court workers available in the communities, to ensure that uh, police priorities also include cultural safety. Um, but all that said, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm aware that more still needs to be done, uh, and so I certainly am alive to that and uh, intend to, to see that we can continue to do more as we go forward to build on the successes that we already have. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Tunaday Wilde. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as mentioned in my um, member statement, uh, there has been a severe decline in uh, the vascular surge on Kutsuke. Uh, and overhunting is a concern that they had, uh, and they hired four, four staff to help address this. Um, and this area in question is uh, quite a large area, and um, I have a question for the Minister of the UNR. Uh, what is the minister's plan to assist the Lutsuka Dene First Nation with the issue of uh, overhunting in the region? Thank you, Member for Tunde Welde, Minister responsible for Environment and Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, barren ground caribou are a shared resource and a shared responsibility, and it's important that we all work together to help the recovery. The band is a member of the Bathurst Caribou uh, Advisory Committee, which works on their management plan for the herd. The band also participates in the Bathurst Car Caribou Range Plan Working Group, which uh, will guide management of the herd mo late moving on. Uh, and ENR continues to support the band and other Indigenous governments and organizations with their monitoring. This is uh, in addition to the ENR's regular monitoring of the Bathurst Caribou Herd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Tunaday Wilde. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. Um, I know that there are uh, two uh, ENR uh, monitored uh, stations. Um, but there's still not a lot of uh, hunters that are not checking and reporting their, their harvest. Um, uh, what is the, the minister going to do to pro ensure the proper reporting is met? Thank you, Member for Tunde Welade, Minister of Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't know if I heard the last part of the question, but um, I'm thinking so. Ian conducts regular uh, at ground and aerial monitoring of the mobile zone. And uh, like we do have the two checkpoints there that are manned 24 seven during the season. And I know from talking to some of the hunters, the, the monitors and the st uh, staff actually stop people and talk to them and communicate. And some of the times if they heard or see um, some challenges then they investigate that further. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Tunaday Welde. Um, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with those uh, four um, 
monitors that the LKDF and had. I'm just wondering if the, uh, the minister can make any commitment to the LKDF and to help fund those positions. Mr. Thank you, member for Tunde Wilde, Minister of Environment and Natural Resources. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> um, we are working with the, the community um, through the Nature Fund and some of that stuff there. So the community is actually coming up with the funding. We have monitors right now on the ground. We work with the, paying for those. Um, again, so unfortunately I can't say we're going to pay for those four, but we do have staff and we do have an, a one staff in the community uh, on our own. RRO2 position. So right now we do fund those things. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary member for two. Okay, sorry. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Haver South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sorry about that. <laughs> Actually, I guess uh, I'd like to uh, I have a question, I guess, for the Premier. Uh, it's to do with uh, red tape, and I'm just wondering uh, what this government is planning to do to alleviate the amount of red tape that we have within the departments. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Haver South, Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Red tape has been identified as an issue for oh, well over four years, I can say. In the last assembly, we heard it often. Um, within our priorities, we identified that we need to support northern businesses and our mandate that will be tabled later. We have some of the policies that we will be reviewing. I'm not going to go through the three right now because we haven't tabled our mandate yet. Um, but we recognize as a government, and, and the bigger thing is that we need to support northern businesses and northern residents. So some of the red tape is necessary. We also need to make sure that we protect the environment and we protect uh, all different things that can come up. But we're, we're going to be looking through them all and to make sure that uh, what's not necessary is not there. We shouldn't be just developing the pen for the sake of writing. We should be using the pen to make sure that we capture all of the risks but it's as comprehensive and uh, appealing to people as possible so that people can access contracts within the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Premier. Member for here or so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The other, and I guess, last question I have for the Premier is that we've been uh, here now for five, roughly five months, I guess, since the writ was dropped. and. In my community in Hay River, and I guess in the regions, is we've been looking for contractors are looking for work and people are looking for jobs. What is this government's plan uh, immediately, I guess, to start looking at putting people to work and ensuring that contracts are, are put out there? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Hay River South. Honorable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, um, None of us believe in that red tape that's not necessary should be there, so we will be looking at them all across. Um, the philosophy is, and, and we maintain that not only on uh, which will be coming in our tabled mandate, but also in the priorities that we looked as as cabinet ministers when we talked about what are our priorities. We identified northern businesses and northern residents taking opportunities versus the south. So that is one of our priorities. What have we done? So we're already starting it. We've been. We are. Uh, I attended Roundup, for an example. I'm a diamond driller's daughter, I'm proud of that, and I support the industry wholeheartedly, but I was very adamant in saying, I support the industry, but I also support northern business and northern residents, so I will not accept that it's just about industry and it's about we do whatever we can to get industries into the territories unless there's a benefit to northerners. And I was pretty blunt, people know me as being very honest, I'm pretty blunt in saying, what's the use of having the mining companies in the north if there's no benefits to our residents? So that message I will carry forward with me as I move forward. I expect that from my ministers. I expect that from all MLAs. We have an obligation to make sure that the benefits of the Northwest Territories, as many as possible, stay in the Northwest Territories. And that is my commitment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Premier. 
Remember, we're here for seven. Questions. questions. Member for Cam Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today I spoke about trust and building trust within this House and also within our community. So my questions today are for Madam Premier. Mr. Speaker, what I'd like to know is how is this Assembly building trust between our members and between this House and our constituents? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Kamlik. Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was noted, I mean, we've talked about it a lot, the newspaper, the media, everybody has said this is a change government. They had, um, and I have to put it back and say that the, the last government also was supposed to be a change government, but I didn't feel that the people felt that it was change enough. So they spoke out very loudly and saying, we're going to try it again. We're changing up our government. So we made a commitment. So there's something wrong with the way that politicians, if we were all doing a great job, we would all be the same members would be still here. I'm not saying that any of the colleagues didn't do a great job. I re respect them all, but the people weren't satisfied, and so we weren't doing a good job. I think a lot of times the government has been uh, pretty guarded in what we've done. Um, we've taken a, a view sometimes, in my personal opinion, that says that we should know best. And if we don't know best, we look weak. I have to say that I'm a mom, I'm a social worker, I'm a woman. I don't know if that makes a difference, but I believe it does. I don't see weakness as a, a, the lack of knowing the answers is a weakness that I don't see as something that is a barrier. I see it as a strength when you're willing to put out there. So already you see that this, this cabinet has tried to work more closely with MLAs. We've shared information that has never been shared before. Um, I hear the frustration of MLAs when we try to move in that way. They're saying, you're taking too much, you're sharing too much, like you get some work done. So it's about finding that fine balance is what I'm struggling with. How much do we work together and build that trust, that relationship, and yet how much do we hold and, and get the work done? I know some members have said we've been here six months and nothing's happened. Um, other members are saying we've been here six months and they're seeing incredible things happen with the change in how we're working across the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Premier. Member for Kamlik. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my next question for the Premier would be, given yesterday's events around rural college staffing, how does this government intend to do a better job with consistent communication, uh, public-facing communication? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Cam Lake. Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, um, again, the mandate letters will be coming within this session. Um, all members will be uh, told to engage as much as possible with stakeholders. That is important. The events that happened yesterday were a little bit um, unusual in that it some things you can share very openly, Mr. Speaker. Um, if I'm looking at, we're looking at doing programs or changing policies or legislation, all open. We should be as transparent and open as possible. When we're talking about people's lives, individuals, Mr. Speaker, I do think we have to pull back a little bit and make sure that we're cautious because one is being open and transparent, the other is talking about the respect, the person behind that. One of the members talked about suicide today. A lot of times, if we're not careful of how we treat people, um, that is a risk that we take. I'm not willing to take that risk. I'd rather, as a leader, be told that I'm not open when it comes to talking about personal issues of people. I will talk generally about issues of people, though, and that's how we'll try to work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Premier. Member for Kamlik. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, yesterday, we heard a lot from colleagues uh, about their concern over the way boards are staffed and managed. So, does the Premier agree that the way that boards are appointed and managed could be improved to better build public trust? Thank you. Thank you, Member for Kamlik. Honourable Premier. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. I've already had conversations with all of our cabinet, and uh, we're talking about terms of boards. Um, I find that sometimes, and, and in fairness to all of us here, is, is sometimes our plates are so busy, the easy answer is just to reappoint the person that's been there before, because it's easy. They're already there, we've already gone through the vetting, we know who they are. Is that the best end, it, way to appoint boards? And that's what I've been challenging my cabinet with. I think they're all in agreement. We will be actually looking at terms of boards because there's, all, there's, there's a benefit to having corporate knowledge, the person that has the knowledge. There's a real benefit to having new blood 
We see that here in this assembly, the, a younger and new uh, voice. And I think that we have an obligation to make sure in all of our boards that we have an equal balance of people that have the knowledge and people that have great new ideas coming forward. So it's a discussion we're on, and you will see a change within our policies um, within this uh, term. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Premier. Final supplementary, member for Camley. Oral questions, member for Framley. Now, see, Monsieur le Président, my questions for the Minister of Education, Culture and Employment on the issue of coordination of municipal and education authorities' uh, term of office. Uh, so, I'd like uh, to know, or can the Minister tell us uh, whether and when he has received any formal request from the Yellowknife Education Authorities, or CSF TNO? requesting changes to allow for a four-year term. Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake. Minister responsible for education, culture and employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In March of 2019, YK1 and YCS uh, raised the issue through a joint letter to ECE. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, CSFTNO has not raised the issue in, through a formal channel like that, but I'm, I'm sure it's on their radar. Uh, and ECE officials have engaged with the Yellowknife DEAs uh, to begin trying to figure out how to uh, uh, solve this issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to uh, thank the uh, Minister for that information. Uh, uh, we've been informed, uh, the Yellowknife Education Authorities, the, by the Yellowknife Education Authorities, that overwhelming opinion of parents is that they want money spent on education rather than holding elections. Uh, does the Minister agree with that additional cost for separate elections by education authorities um, to conduct their own elections would be better spent on children's education? I'll see Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the best spent money is always on children's education, so it's hard to uh, uh, argue with that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Monsieur le Président, I want to thank the Minister for the straightforward response. Uh, the situation for CSF TNO is different, as I mentioned in my statement, in that its commissaires uh, represent two communities uh, that now have different uh, uh, cycles for their municipal elections. So, to me, it, Mr. Speaker, it sounds like the, the best solution here may be to allow education authorities to set their own terms of office, with approval of the Minister, of course. Uh, so I, I'm sure the Minister is aware of this complication, but I'm wondering whether his department has contemplated a solution for the term of office issue for CSF TNO. I see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The department is aware and looking into this. Uh, unfortunately, I have to report that we don't have a silver bullet for this issue. It's going to take a bit more research. Uh, but, you know, we're committed to doing that, and I'll get back to the member uh, when we have that information. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Frame Lake. Merci, Monsieur le Président. I want to thank the Minister. Uh, great to hear that uh, he and his staff are working already on this issue. I'm just wondering uh, whether the Minister can commit to make the small changes that are likely necessary in the Education Act to avoid spending money on elections rather than education. Can he make those changes before 2021? Must see, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Frame Lake, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the Department has looked at a uh, number of ways of doing this. Unfortunately, there's no way of getting around the fact that the board members were elected for a fixed period of time. And any change to that uh, period of time to extend it would be anti-democratic. If you're elected to a certain period, uh, if the voters vote you in and they think that you're going to be there for this many years because that's what the legislation says, I'm not willing to extend that. Uh, what would be required would be a plebiscite, similar to what uh, uh, municipalities do. So unfortunately, there's no way to just, uh, I, I believe in democracy, I'm a strong supporter of democracy, and uh, I don't believe that we should be uh, extending term limits, you know. Uh, we're, not, uh, we're not kings here, we're politicians who are duly elected. Uh, but that being said, uh, the department has had conversations with the education authorities, we're committed to working with them to, to mitigate uh, the cost uh, to the, as much as we can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a question for the Minister of Health and Social Services. Does, do we presently have a suicide prevention strategy? Thank you, Member Yellowknife North, Minister Responsible for Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Department of Health and Social Services does not currently have a specific suicide prevention strategy. However, the Child and Youth Mental Wellness Action Plan contains commitment to develop a suicide prevention and crisis response network. I'd like to add also, part of the work includes uh, funding to support community-based prevention activities, improve screening by imp implement implementing two standardized suicide risk assessment tools, one for adults and one for youth, these tools were rolled out this summer in 2019. We also have a devel development of a coordinated approach to responding to suicide or other crisis. This work currently is in the process and will focus on a clear process for health and social service system when a crisis occurs. A key piece of this process will be engaging with community impacted and taking our lead from them as to what supports they need. Also, I'd like to add the department also delivers a prevention program aimed at educating residents on the signs that someone may be thinking of suicide or in how to connect them to resources. In addition, the programs, these programs are called Mental Health First Aid and Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training, and they're delivered across the Northwest Territories by the Health and Social Service Authorities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the Minister starting that question with a clear no, and I also appreciate that all of those programs are doing great work, and I know that everyone in that department takes this issue seriously. Yet our jobs at MLAs is to look at the larger pictures, to look at systemic issues, to make sure departments are not silo taking a siloed approach to an issue such as suicide. This is why the importance of government strategies or what we need to do our jobs. Will the minister commit to developing a suicide prevention strategy in the life of this government? Thank you, member for Yellowknife North, Minister of Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like I mentioned to the member that we are looking at developing a suicide prevention and crisis response network. Thank you. Thank you, minister. Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't wish to get into a date of semantics, but it's important to note that in the GNWT, the word strategy has a very specific meaning. <laughs> it is not the response program that the minister is talking about. However, I have another question for the minister. It is important to address this, that we have all the information to do our jobs. So my question for the minister is, do we presently track suicide attempts in addition to suicide deaths? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife North, Minister of Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When a Northwest Territories resident dies by suicide in another jurisdiction outside the Northwest Territories, we are notified that the person has died, passed away, but we are not notified with a formal notification as the cause of the death. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Final supplementary, Member for Yellowknife North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is uh, clear that I am asking my questions out of the order in which I provided them to the minister. That was, uh, it is important that we start tracking um, suicides in other jurisdictions as many of our residents get lost once they head down south. But my question for the minister was, do we presently track suicide attempts? Thank you. Thank you, member for Yellowknife North, Minister of Health and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We do track data regarding hospitalizations for self-harm, but not for suicide attempts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I apologize to the member for that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Oral questions. Member for Yellowknife Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, my questions are for the Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. There is a lack of clarity about why Tom Weger is no longer the president of Aurora College. He has told the media he was fired, yet the minister has told the media he resigned. As I said in the House yesterday, I believe the public is owed an explanation of why this man no is no longer working for the government after the extensive efforts made to recruit him to this job in the first place. Can the minister please provide clarity? Clarification. Merci. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife Centre, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for allowing me to clarify uh, this situation a little bit. I'm not going to speak to the reasons for termination. That's uh, that's the Premier's domain. Uh, that position serves at the pleasure of the Premier. But I, I will note that I was aware last week there was going to be a meeting between uh, Dr. Weger and the Premier. I, don't, I didn't know what the uh, ultimate outcome of that would be. I don't know if it was presupposed. Uh, late last week, I discovered uh, that uh, Dr. Weger and the GNWT would be parting ways. Now, I, don't, I wasn't privy to the, the conversation, so I don't know if uh, it was the conversation ended with a firing, per se, or if it ended with both parties uh, agreeing that perhaps it was time to, uh, to part ways. And then on Tuesday, after the media release was issued, uh, I received an email sent on behalf of Dr. Tom Weger that stated, after much contemplation and soul searching, I've decided to step away from post-secondary education leadership for the time being, which led me to believe that he was stepping away from post-secondary leadership education for the time being uh, voluntarily. And that's uh, why, why I made the statements that I did. It's come to light, however, that uh, this was in fact a termination. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife Centre. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the Minister um, clarifying that. Um, one of the things that uh, the former President has said is that he felt a strong resistance to change uh, from the College administration and that this factored into his decision. Is the Minister aware of this issue and what does he plan to do about it? Thank you. Thank you, member for Yellowknife Centre, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Change is always hard. Uh, I assumed uh, years ago, or uh, rather when uh, this was first discussed in the Assembly, that it would be difficult uh, to change. And actually, the, one of the first meetings I had, I think the very first meeting I had with Dr. Weaker, I asked him if he was uh, getting any resistance. And if so, that I, would wa I wanted to work with him to ensure that we uh, made these changes. You know, I'm, I'm all in favor of uh, developing a world-class, arm's-length university here in the Northwest Territories, and that is good. there will be some uh, changes, uh, there will be some bold changes, and I'm fully in support of those. Uh, so going forward, maybe it's something I need to be a little more forceful with, more alive to, uh, but uh, I'm confident that the, the team we have in place now can implement those changes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for Yellowknife Centre. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the Minister for that response. Um, it sounds like not everybody is on the same page even now with the, uh, the bold idea to transform the college. So I'm wondering uh, if you have any plans to reassure staff and students, and, and in fact to inform staff and students and the public that this transformation is on track, it is going to go ahead, and uh, that you are going to support it wholeheartedly, whatever the resistance. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife Centre, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, yesterday, responding to questions from the member for Yellowknife North, uh, I, I committed my support to this project. I, I think this is an amazing opportunity. This is, I am privileged to be part of this transformation of Aurora College into a polytechnic university, and I'm wholeheartedly behind it. Uh, I've been having conversations as of late that we need to do a better job explaining this to the public. And so moving forward, uh, I'm going to be releasing more information about what we're doing. We have a plan that is nearing completion, an implementation plan, which will lay out the next steps. That's going to be ready for release uh, after the sitting in the summer. Uh, but I've decided that we need to fill that information void and get some more information out there so everyone can be excited because this is a great opportunity. Uh, it's a great opportunity for our students. It's a great opportunity for 
uh, the people of the territory because we're going to be able to fill a lot of these uh, positions that uh, we can't fill right now. And it's a great opportunity for all of the communities where the college is located because uh, I expect that, that every community with a, with a university campus will benefit economically. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Final supplementary Yellowknife member for Yellowknife Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the uh, minister's answer on that. Um, I'm, I'm looking really more at specific communication that would take place with the staff and students at Aurora College. Um, apparently, they didn't see this change in leadership coming. Um, they feel uncertain about their, their own place there and about the future of the college. So, uh, is the minister going to make an effort to talk directly with students and not only get their buy-in to this change, but to reassure them that that he is in fact in charge. Thank you. Thank you, Member for Yellowknife Centre, Minister of Education, Culture and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And direct communication with the staff and the students is part and parcel of the type of communication that I want to do. And I will be reaching out, uh, and I will uh, reinforce uh, my commitment. Uh, like I said, this is a great opportunity. I'm lucky to be involved with it, and I'm going to see it through to completion, and we're going to wind up with a world-class university in the Northwest Territories. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Oral questions. Member for the New Vic Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my questions are for the minister responsible for NTPC. Um, yesterday, my colleague questioned the minister um, regarding the board. The minister stated that DMs are not DMs when they are sitting on this board, but then he stated the deputy ministers are using their skill sets to run it. This is in Hansard. So, how can we ensure that the DMs that are not DMs are impartial when making decisions that are made um, when it's involving their departments? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Nevik Twin Lakes, Minister responsible for the Northwest Territories Power Corporation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I apologize. They are not DMs, but their skill sets they have there are actually helping the board run. And it, right now, we're filling them in that position until we get the governance model moved forward. So we've asked them to come up with a governance model, and we're util utilizing their skill sets. To do this job. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Member for New Vic Twin Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The NWT needs to trust this government, as my other colleague has said today. I know the Minister has asked the Chair and the Board to come up with a governance model and options, but these are the DMs not the DMs on this board. Can the minister have this board made up of regional reps sooner than later? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for New Vic Twin Lakes. Minister responsible for the Northwest Territories Power Corporation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I want to do it right. I've asked them to come up with them. I've given them clear directions. I've asked them to come up with a model that works for the North. If it, is it a model of public interest groups across the, t individuals across the territories to do it? Is it a combination of utilizing government and non-government people? So I've given them three or four options to look at so they can come to us with a better option to run that corporation. So right now, I'm gonna stick to what I've asked them to do and I'm willing to work with committee once we get this information. So I got to work with my colleagues and then I got to work with you guys to come up with this. It's about doing what's right. And it's great to say, yeah, make a decision now. Can't do that. This is why sometimes we in government get ourselves into difficult situations. So unfortunately, no. I've given them some clear direction to give us some parameters, some options, and they're working at it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, member for New Vic Twin Lakes. All right, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, the impartial part. How can we ensure that decisions by this board 
and that they represent different departments that we know that they're not they're being impartial thank you mr speaker <laughs> thank you member for new victory <laughs> minister of the northwest territories power corporation hmm good question um i trust that they're going to do this i know that i will be having a meeting with the board when i can fit it into our schedule um, they've made a commitment they've made an oath they've signed a document saying they're going to be impartial they're looking out with what's best for the northwest territories that's what they're there for we've looked at their skill sets and that's how we got them in place right now so i am going to trust them moving forward unless they break that trust and then as the minister we make some quick decisions after that thank you mr speaker thank you minister colleagues our time for oral questions has expired written questions written questions member for yale knife center Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my questions are for the Premier. About 18 months ago, the Government of the Northwest Territories hired an executive search firm to assist in finding qualified applicants for the dual role of President of Aurora College and Associate Deputy Minister of Post-Secondary Education Renewal. Can the Premier tell us how much the executive search firm was paid? And Number one, the salary range advertised for the president slash associate deputy minister role. Number two, the average cost of relocating a successful candidate to Yellowknife. Number three, the severance provisions included in a standard deputy minister employment contract. And number four, the standard severance cost of ending a deputy minister employment contract at the one year mark. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, member for Yellowknife Center. Written questions. Written questions. Member for Mumphrey. Masiya, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in light of alarming rates of incarceration of Indigenous people face in the Northwest Territories, I submit the following written questions to the Minister of Justice. One, in the past 10 years, what programs or initiatives the territorial government has launched to keep Indigenous people out of jail? And what do, what do the evaluation of those various programs and initiatives concluded about the effectiveness of each? Two, what proportion of territorial present staff are indigenous, broken down by employment category, especially management, program delivery, and guards? Three, what proportion of territorial present staff are dedicated full-time to counseling, vocational training, education upgrading for inmates, and what share of the territorial correction system appropriate to is allocated for those purposes? Four, what has our correction systems done to enhance access into screening, diagnosis, treatment of offenders suffering AFAS, fetal alcohol syndrome dis disorder? Similarly, with non traditional approaches, have a course adopted to dealing with such offenders? And five, last question is. What program has the Minister's Department made in response to the 18 separate calls for action contained in a Federal Truth and Reconciliation Commission relating to justice and correction matters? Must see, Mr. Speaker. I'll see you, Member for Mumphrey. Written questions. Written questions. Returns to written questions. Returns to written questions. Replies to the Commissioner's address. Replies to the Commissioner's address. Petitions. Petitions. Report of Committees on the Review of Bills. Report of Committees on the Review of Bills. Reports of Standing and Special Committees. Report of Standing and Special Committees. Tabling of Documents. Member for Thabacha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to table two documents relating to my member's statement and oral questions earlier today. First, a joint letter from Fort Smith leadership dated June the 17, 2019, regarding the Fort Smith Airport infrastructure, and a letter dated July the 8th, 2019, which was a reply from then 
Governor of the Northwest Territories, Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member for Thabacha. Tabling of documents. Member for Mumphrey. Masia, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I wish to table the following two documents. First is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, Calls to Action. And the second document is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. These should be our guiding principles as we move forward as territorial government. Masi. Thank you, Member for Mumphrey. Members, I wish to table the report of the Auditor General of Canada to the Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly 2020. Independent, independent Auditor's Report, Early Childhood to Grade 12 Education in the Northwest Territories, Department of Education, Culture and Employment. Tabling of documents. Tabling of documents. Notices of motion. Notices of motion. Motions. Motions. Notices of motion for the first reading of bills. Notices of motion for the first reading of bills. First reading of bills. First reading of bills. Second reading of bills. Second reading of bills. Consideration in the Committee of the Whole of Bills and Other Matters. Consideration in Committee of the Whole and Bills of Other Matters. Reports of Committee of the Whole. Report of Committee of the Whole. Third reading of bills. Third reading of bills. Mr. Clerk, orders of the day. Orders of the day for Friday, February the 7th, 2020, 10 a.m. Prayer, minister statements, member statements, returns to oral questions, recognition of visitors in the gallery, acknowledgments, oral questions, written questions, returns to written questions, replies to commissioner's address, petitions, reports of committees on the review of bills, reports to standing in special committees, tabling of documents, notices of motion, motions, notices of motion for first reading of bills, first reading of bills, second reading of bills, consideration in committee of the whole of bills and other matters, report of committee of the whole, third reading of bills, orders of the day. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Colleagues, this House stands adjourned until Friday, February 7, 2020 at 10 a.m.